Yes, we are on lesson number five. And the title of this lesson is To the Jews, a Stumbling Block. And this lesson is based on Acts chapter 3, 1 to 17, and also Acts chapter 4, 1 through 12. Let us pray before we get started. Our Father, as we come before you once more, we want to give you thanks for the opportunity to gather together once more to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we want to thank you for carrying us through another week. Thank you, Lord God, for your guidance and protection. Thank you for providing for our daily needs. And Lord, as we are about to open your words, I pray, Lord, that we will just clear our minds, Lord, so we can focus, so we can learn, so we can share what we know about you. And just to forget about the trials of the week, Lord, we thank you for your love towards us. We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. Lord, be with us throughout this day. Be with this service, Lord God, and I pray that it will just be a blessing to all of us. Thank you for hearing us, and thank you for all that you have done, as I pray to your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Just a little recap and on what we have been through so far. When we go back to, well, from, from we started in Acts chapter 3, oh. I see where there is a call for repentance and we can see that in verse 19 it says repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the lord and also in acts chapter 4 verse 12 it says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And also in verse 25 of Acts chapter 3, where it, it speaks it, it speaks about the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth be blessed. And going back even further, I think this is in Acts chapter 2, yeah, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, so I think it is very important, you know, when we see the call for repentance. And I have three questions to ask. We see the call to repentance. And this is a question. So is it possible for everyone to be saved in this time in which we are living? Is it possible for everyone to be saved? It is possible, but it's not what's going to happen. 
All right. And why do you say it is not going to happen if it is possible for it to happen? <laughs> well, it is possible because Jesus Christ came and died for all the sins of all men to restore us in relationship with the Father. That's what makes it possible. Why it's not going to happen is because not all men trust him. Not all men believe him. We're told in Scripture that, that broad is the gate and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many will follow it. In other words, that the majority of people are going to reject Christ as opposed to receiving Christ. And in that case, they're not going to be saved. Okay, so as much as it is possible, you are saying it is not going to happen. So is it okay to say that it is not possible for everyone to be saved? No. It's not okay to say that. If we say that, that means that Christ's sacrifice for us is not for everybody. That it only he he only died for a certain number or a certain group or whatever, and the others just they're out of luck. But that's not the case. He died for everyone. Romans tells us that he justified all men, not some, not many, not most, but all men. But in order to benefit from that, you must trust him. You must believe. You must accept what he's done. And yet not everybody's going to do that. Hmm. So we, we can't say it's not for everybody because it is for everybody but not everybody is going to accept it. There's a big difference. I agree, so, with you. I agree with you, Brother Rob. <laughs> if we say it's not possible, we're making um, John 3, 16 of no avail. It says for whosoever, whosoever is whoever, anybody, everybody. If, the, the, the thing about it is the choice that they will make and we know what the scripture how could rob say not everybody will accept it because the bible tells us that the bible tells us about the broad road that many people will choose the broad road and not the narrow road they chose the broad road not because it wasn't possible for them to choose the narrow roads but they chose the broad road so it is possible that everybody but we know not everybody will accept the gift so saying, saying, all right, I, I know it, it has to do with our choices, you know, but he, all right, Rob and Jen, they put, the Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. So isn't this telling us like not everyone will make it, basically? Yes. But those that don't make it, don't make it by their choice. Yeah, yeah. I believe so. And, you know, one of the reasons I ask this question is because you have people out there that believe, you know, I was talking to someone, and they believe also that you can be saved through someone else. Mm -hmm. Not your personal relationship with Christ, but through someone else's re relationship. And, you know, just thinking about that, and how could someone come up with that idea? to believe that, you know, they can be saved, not by their personal relationship or, you know, their sacrifice in giving up the things of this world, but through someone else's. 
So I can think of a scripture that you're making. First of all, you said not to be saved by another relationship, but by their sacrifice. They're not nobody saved by their sacrifice either. Yeah. I... By faith are we saved through grace. It's a gift of God. And until Christians truly realize that the crooks of the whole salvation thing, yes, we have a choice to make to accept the gift. It is a gift. And when we accept that gift, Christ works this out in us, and then we have the good works. And not that it's not the good works that save us, it's Christ. And even when we do all this good work, it will never, ever be good enough. It's Christ and his work. Right. About this saving to other people, there are two places where I remember one scripture, and I can't, I don't know if Rob can think of it right now, where it talk about the husband, the wife in an unbelieving marriage and if the wife whatever it says the husband is sanctified by it or something like that so it gives the impression i don't do you know the text that i'm alluding to rob i know like, the one you're alluding to I, I can find it here in just a minute yeah so people tend to think that it's saying well you know that the, the wife that you know like don't leave you unsanctified wife because by your thing you you know whatever like the bed is sanctified or the children are sanctified something like that so they believe that and it Probably if Rob is able to find it, we can talk some more about that. It doesn't mean that person is going to heaven. There is like sometimes there is a broad brushstroke and overview of what this can look like. And then when you get into how is that achieved? Because by the sanctified example and the godliness, that may draw the person to want to be godly and accept the gift also it don't mean that okay if the wife is a christian and the husband is not a christian because the wife is a christian the husband will make it to heaven you know so that's not what that meant and also there's another verse that can be misinterpreted too i think it was jesus giving us our paul was talking to them and say why pray ye for the dead or something like that if you don't believe in the resurrection something something mm -hmm. to the sense of that when he was using their belief to try to bring home a truth to them, which makes people think that, okay, if a person die, we can pray their soul in. But again, we can't take one scripture and make a doctrine out of it. We have to look at the context and we have to see what is an overwhelming thought on a particular subject, you know, because the Bible will not contradict itself. So I don't know if anybody know those two verses, but I know those are two verses that people will often want to pull out of context to justify. I don't have to do nothing. You know what? My husband is a Christian, so I'm cool. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. The first one you're talking about is 1 Corinthians 7, 14, where the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. I think that's the one one of them that you were talking about. Yes. yes. So what exactly does that mean? So, you know, what does that mean? Well, if you notice, one of the things that it does not say is that the husband is saved by the wife or the wife is saved by the husband. It doesn't say that. It says they're sanctified, which does mean that they're made holy but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're saved. What that means is that they are set apart for God's purposes. Yes. And if you look at the end of that verse, else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. In other words, if the unbelieving spouse was not sanctified, then their works would all be towards unholiness or unrighteousness, uncleanness, and that's where the children would go. But because of the work of the other one, because of the righteousness of the other one, the believer, it helps bring the unbeliever along and puts them to work in the same path that the believer is working in, and that helps the children to follow that path as well, the path to righteousness, the path to holiness. So it does. it's not talking about salvation here, but it's talking about a growth 
with God or towards God. Mm -hmm. And they're not necessarily the same thing. Amen. Yes, amen. Oh, see. Yes, and when I earlier had mentioned sacrifice, the reason why I mentioned that or why I said that was based on what I was saying. We cannot just live however we want. You know, yes, it is Christ helping us, you know, to give up the things of this world, you know, but we cannot expect to do whatever we feel like and enjoy the things of this world. And, you know, and there are others that are living right by Christ. And, you know, we expect to be saved through them. Yes, Sister, Sister Yolene, can go ahead? Yes, for the first Corinthians 7, verse 14, we see that by the example of the wife, the husband, with a godly heart, will follow what the wife is doing and choose to accept Christ in his life. That's how we get sanctified. Mm -hmm. And also for the children. And verse 15 says, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God had called us to peace. We are not responsible for their salvation. But the action we do, the way we carry ourselves as Christians, can bring our partners, our, our husband or wife or children to follow our footsteps and surrender to God and convert to, to Christianism and follow Christ. Like that, they will be saved. And if they don't want to be saved, they don't want to follow the step, let them depart. You will not carry the blame on yourself not to have them come to salvation. Because it's of God to, to know who will be saved. And if they agree to choose the good step that we are, example, we are giving them, then they will be part of the crowd. Sanctification is a chosen. Someone who is sanctified mm -hmm. is chosen. It's not anything like this, like that. It's an act of God choosing you to be who you are for him and in him. He chose you to do something. He put you apart for, for a purpose. So we have to understand exactly what it is now when you receive sanctification, that like us, we are trying, we're striving, but without Christ, we cannot do anything on our own, except if Christ is in us, can we do something? But always the good example at home is to be given by the Christian so the other people in the home can see the good in you and want that good thing to serve Christ like you are doing. All right, thank you for sharing. Yes. And can I cause someone to go to hell or to be lost based on my actions or my influence? And example, if I decide I'm to go rob a bank, right? And I tell my friend or something, you know, I am carrying him along with me. And in that process, he, he got shot and died. Would that be me who caused him to lose his way? Well, the, uh, I think we have a conscience to make choices. And that's where... The, the spirit of God speak to us to do and not to do. You go to the store, you want to buy a loaf of bread, but you see the chocolate bar right there. Nobody is watching. You feel like, if I take this, would somebody pay attention? Nobody needs to see you. Your conscience will tell you this is not for you. If you cannot pay for it, don't touch it. The same way, if your conscience tell you to go over back or your mind, you're already in your loss, Life, you want to go and steal, break a bank or something. You call somebody to come with you. That person has that conscience in her or him, whatever it is, to say no, to stop you from doing wrong or let you do it on your own because their conscience has to talk to them and let them know what is being done is not of good. And if they do it, 
it's the what to do or to follow, to be a follower, not to think for themselves. And you putting the person in the situation to say, let's do it together. You have a part to pay in that because you should be the one to guide to the right path. Being that you were already lost on your own, you want to carry this one to be lost with you. This shows that you are in part responsible <laughs> for doing hmm. this because of the advice or the, the offer you give to that person to follow you in that footstep. But the person also is responsible for not thinking on its own. I cannot do that. I should not do that because it's not godly. But if the two of you are already lost, you know, there is nothing we can do about that. It's All right. Christ um, we save. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Sister Elaine. Rob and Jen put in the chat, sure, we can influence people in the wrong path. The Trinity deception is one example. And that's the thing. You cannot cause a person to be lost or saved, but you can influence them either direction. And I think this is what Sister Yolaine was getting at and even what Rob and Jen are saying there. By the things that we do, the things that we say to others, that can help lead them one path or the other. It doesn't cause them to go there. They still have that personal choice to make for themselves, but it can influence them that direction. And so it can influence them towards salvation or away from salvation, but it doesn't make it happen. Thank you, Brother Rob. All right, I, I'm going to read Acts 3, 19 to 26, and then we're going to question 12. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And ye shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you whom the heavens must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God had spoken by his mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall be, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever ye shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away from one of you, from turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And question 12, the first part, it says, having reminded the people of what the prophets had said, what direct statement did he make to them? What was that direct statement? And it is in verse 25. Yeah, he says, you're children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers. Yes, and what does he mean when he said, you are the children of the prophets? The, they're the ones to which these messages were spoken, the things that the prophets had to say. The plan of salvation, you're the ones that this is 
spoken to. This is the one that you're the ones that is for. And they should be the ones that are teaching the same things that the prophets had taught. Thank you, Brother Rob. Anyone else would like to share? All right, on the next part of question 12, it says, in what words was that covenant contained? In the seed, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And we know the seed is Christ Jesus. So that's where our blessings is coming from, from Christ. He's the one to bring salvation. And we should be obedient to him and accept him and follow him. What, thank you, Sister Julian. In 25, hmm? it says, Saying unto Abraham, hmm? and in thy seed. So whose seed? Is he referring to? The seed of Abraham, which Paul writes later and tells us that is seed singular, not plural, which yeah. that seed is Christ. Okay. And on the last part of question 12, to how many were the blessings of the covenant promise all thy kindred all thy kindred that means from the seed which is Christ everybody who trusts and believes in Christ can find salvation uh, Paul explains this a little further in Galatians 3 starting in verse 7 he says know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So that tells us that it's not, that these promises are not just to the physical lineage of Abraham, but to those who are of the belief of Abraham, those who believed God and it was counted unto them as righteousness. Amen. And it, it goes back to what we we're talking about before. Salvation is for everyone. And we see it over and over in Acts. And even in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So, it is for everyone, but they, it's sad not everyone is going to choose Christ. Moving on to question 13, it says, through whom does the blessing come? That's the first part. And you read 20, verse 26, it says, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And so is he saying we are only blessed if we turn away from our iniquities? Like thinking about no. The world we are living in right now. We know that God is caring for everyone. So what does this mean? What blessing is this talking about? Uh, it, it is a blessing for everyone. And it, it tells us here clearly that God sent his son to turn us away from our iniquities, to turn us from sin. We're not meant to live a life of sin. That was never God's plan. It's not what he wants now. Isaiah says our sin does separate us from God. And so the, the more we choose to continue in sin, 
the more we put a barrier between us and God. Jesus turning us away from sin is turning us back to the Father, a life of holiness, a life of righteousness, to have a character like the Father has. It's our <laughs> choice which we want to do. There, there, there's many preachers and teachers that say that we have to continue to sin until Jesus comes. Well, you know what? Jesus did come. Mm -hmm. He came before to, and to deliver us from sin. He defeated sin in the flesh at that time so that if we will unite with him, sin shall have no more dominion over us. We do not have to continue in a life of sin. We can live a life of righteousness with God, which is what he's called us to do. He gives us the power to do. Jesus Christ <laughs> overcame both, both the power and the penalty of sin. And so we don't have to continue in sin. Sin is detrimental to us in every way. And Jesus Christ came to deliver us from that. Thank you for sharing, Brother Rob. And I was talking to someone, and I'm sure every one of us might realize this, that when it comes to Jesus, or say people that believe in Jesus, I was told that we are weak compared to other people religions like muslim and the reason that was said is because when you look oh they will or they would make fun of jesus in in different ways and they would never think of doing that to a, say like a muslim because they would retaliate immediately i've seen a lot of stuff where they make fun of jesus and do all kind of stuff and even I was watching something about the Olympics, the opening ceremony with the last feast, and they showed a famous painting of the Last Supper. And then they showed one with the LGBT, yeah, all of that. And even the, the closing ceremony, like with, uh, with this thing coming down from heaven, with a lot of like tentacles and stuff like that. So my question, is it that Satan know who he should try and provoke? Because it is always about Jesus, always making fun of Jesus, putting Jesus in, you know, like it's always about Jesus. I, I've never seen where comedians are m making fun of other religious groups and their gods because like they know that they would retaliate so how do you see that is it that satan is trying to provoke us because he know that we believe in the in jesus which is the son of god the difference is our god is love Amen. Our God has also, in, in him being love, he wants us to be instruments of that love. He wants us to reflect that to others. He wants others to see his goodness in us and be drawn to him through that. Their God, and, well, first, our, our God also says, vengeance is mine, I will repay Amen. He's going to take care of that himself when the time comes. Their God is a God of, he's too weak to do anything himself. He doesn't have the capability that he's got to use his followers. It's just like the followers of Islam, those, the ones that are, called radical is Islam, the ones you're talking about that will go and retaliate, even the leaders in that movement don't do it. They send out their peons to mm -hmm. do it. It's like the higher you are, 
the less you do, you get the ones down on the bottom to do all the dirty work so that you don't risk yourself. It's like their God is not going to risk himself. Not that he's really a God. Their God is no God. And, you know, their prophet is a prophet of no God. He's not the prophet of Yahweh. No. Yahweh would take care of this himself when the time comes. He doesn't put it off on us to do, as you, we could say, his dirty work. He's going to take care of it himself when that time comes. He's giving them a chance right now to come unto repentance, just like verse 19 said to start with, repent and be converted. He's not wanting a forced obedience. He's wanting people that see him in love and in his goodness and choose they want to follow him for that not because they're afraid of him and we better do it lest we die. Thank you, Bashir and Brother Rabban. That is all I would I was explaining to them that our God, God is love. We don't need to fight for God like oh they fight for God and they are willing to come and burn your house down and do all kind of crazy stuff. And I've heard it so many times. Christians are weak. Christians are weak. If it was someone else, they wouldn't dare to mess with some other group. The, the, you know? the thing with this is there was the years back where Christians did do all that fighting. Not, I don't believe God called them to do it. I think they did it on their own in the name of God. And so what happens? They're ridiculed for that. Exactly. It's, Look how yeah. awful you are as a Christian because you're fighting in the name of your God. And now they say, look how awful you are as a Christian. You mm -hmm. can't even fight in the yeah. name of your God. I mean, exactly. It, as they say, damned if you do, damned if you don't. <laughs> well, hey, my God will take care of this himself. He is love. That's what I want to show people is the love of God. He says he will repay. Vengeance is his. Mm hmm I'll let him do it when that time comes. Amen. Do you want to so put true. your hands, your, your life in the hands of, of his vengeance? Okay. I'd rather put my life in the hands of his mercy personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen, brother. Sister Royal and then Sister Elaine. Um, I'll, my comment on that question is that the devil knows that there is only one true God and any worship, anybody that's not worshiping the true God is worshiping him. So him be belittling and making fun of Jesus is just showing that Jesus is the true God in, in my opinion because if you're if, if he had a problem with any other God. He'll be having a problem with himself. <laughs> Amen. That, that, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Satan, he, he know who Jesus is. He know Jesus is the son of God. There's no doubt about that. And he's never going to stop doing what he's doing until Jesus comes again. Thank you. Sister Yolene? Yeah. For that last supper ceremony, we saw them having the for the opening where they presented whoever they wanted to present the way they presented it. It was just to to be arrogant and to provoke Christians yes. because when they provoke us, they're waiting for an answer from mm -hmm. us. Yeah, because we know what is in line for us Christians at this moment. That's why we have to stay on our side and do our things, learning and get stronger in the faith, though we don't lose in, in their face. They're doing those things to provoke, and the provocation is the work of Satan, because Satan knows that his time is near. He will be paying for all the things he had presented in mm -hmm. the face of God to take power. He needs power. He wants power. 
and the more he shows his uh, face, the ones who are following him will be growing in numbers because other people who have nothing in their mind to, to hang on to will run to them. But the salvation that God promised is better than what he's giving right now. We have to remember to always stand firm and know that our Lord is able and he has planned for his children for eternity where Satan has his hell waiting for him <clears throat> to pay for his mischievous action by pulling so many toward him while they, would, they could serve God, but they choose to go the wrong way because now the pleasures of this world is worth more for them than following Christ while we are waiting for the, the, uh, the, 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 the coming of Christ to take those who are his and those who are not will be paying with Satan, whatever they're doing at this moment. But nothing for us to be trembling for because we have a savior, we have a father who is able and capable to do exceeding abundantly, just build up our faith and stand firm. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for sharing. And lately, everything is like being, uh, I don't know, it, it's been going on for a long time where you see these things and it's all about everything they are doing in these days. It's about the devil or worshiping the devil. And still your people believe that, oh, it is just an act. It is not. They, they are like showing you what they are doing, who they pledge allegiance to. Like back, back in the days, it used to be in <laughs> secret and a lot of symbols and people wouldn't even pick up on these things. But now it is just open and open. They are not hiding it anymore and people still don't see what's going on. Because the you time know? is near. The time is near. The end that is, is near. That is so true. So, yes. That yes. is so true, Sister Julian. And it, believe me, we, we have social media and it can be used for good and evil. But there's a, a lot of stuff out there that they are revealing stuff to us and showing us that. Because, all right, one thing I realize, you have a lot of people out there, they are not Christians, and they know about all these things. And you have a lot of Christians still falling for the chicks are the devil. They are still going to parties and listening to secular music. It, it is sad. And these people that are not Christians, they are the one putting out certain information that even we can learn from. I was watching this video and it was about music. Like even music that we think are Christian music or love music, all kind of music. And there was this one guy and he's the one that he writes most of the songs for the entertainers, male, female singers. And he tells them how to sing it. And he, he was in an interview and he was saying, angels tell him what to write. So we really need to open our eyes. A lot of stuff we hear and we're thinking, oh, it's talking about love and it's good. And we are listening to these things and dance into these music and it's not about God it, it's not about love we just need to stick to the word of God 
and encourage each other. Because just as Taryn said earlier, and I am guilty of that too. Like you ask God, you ask for God help and you accomplish something. And, and before you know it, it's like that don't matter anymore. You, you move on to something and you just keep going, keep going, keep going. And you don't even remember to be thankful or to give God thanks for what he has been doing. Sister Elaine? Yes, but I was going to add to what you just said. That's why we have to be careful. Because when we think that some preachers are teaching us the truth, in their truth, they slide, they slide in some things that can be very cautious for us Christians because they know where they stand. They know what they have to do. Just to deviate your mind from the real truth, they bring something in between. And then before you know it, you are swamped with things that are not of God. So that's why we have to be very cautious, very, very cautious and pray about it to know the wants of God, what God has planned for us, because his plans are different from the others. We have to be very cautious where we get our information. Amen. All right. Question 14. It says, as Peter and John spoke these things, these words, who came upon them? And we see that in Acts 4, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. And question 15, he says, what troubled those priests and rulers? What troubled those priests and, and rulers? Why they came upon Peter and John. Because of what they were preaching. Yes. Not the people and preached religious resurrection from the dead. Yep. And yeah, and that is found in verse 2 being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And why was that a problem to them? Why was that a problem to the priest and well it says that the sadducees were part of them that came upon them and the sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection they didn't believe man would be resurrected from the dead and so also didn't they know that it happened and they were trying to keep it a secret or they just didn't believe none of them the Sadducees are the ones that came to Jesus and talked about if a man was married to a woman and he died, she was supposed to marry his brother and so forth. And through the seven brothers, and if they all died not having any children, whose wife would she be in the resurrection? Well, the Sadducees brought that, but they did not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. But the Sadducees didn't. And so the Sadducees, I would think they believed that Jesus Christ had been resurrected because he had gone and walked among the people still teaching after the resurrection. And there was all the apostles who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection and teaching that. And since, of course, the Sadducees didn't believe it, they don't want to accept any evidence of it. Which is why one of the teachings was that Jesus Christ never really died. He was just asleep, or he was, they just said that he was dead, and he wasn't really dead. And they didn't want a teaching going out that, yeah, Jesus Christ had died and been resurrected, because then that shows them to be false teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, Brother Rob. And as uh, as you said, people, you have people who believe that Jesus raised himself. And 
how can if you are dead how can you raise yourself from the dead but that only goes to show that as i said he didn't die to start with so uh, and and that's one of several teachings and they they say that to show that he has power even over death and he said destroy this temple and i mm -hmm. will raise it up again but there are numerous verses of scripture it seems like i counted nine or ten of them at one time that actually say the father raised him from the dead and that verse where he says i will take it up again the word translated take is also translated receive mm -hmm. when he died he gave his life back to the father father into your hands i commend my spirit and then when he was re mm -hmm. resurrected he received that life back and it's it's a matter of putting all the scriptures together and seeing how they fit together not just choosing one side or the other but seeing how they fit and when we do that then we will really begin to understand truth. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense, Brother Rob. And even when you think about, say, and if Jesus is dead, you know, I I don't believe that he had the power. You know, because I'm just thinking, if I'm asleep, if I am asleep, right, and say I'm sleeping lightly and I hear talking and stuff around me, I can get up at any time. But if I am in a like a deep sleep, then I am not aware of what's going on. And Jesus, he couldn't have been dead to resurrect himself like it it just don't make any sense because jesus being our perfect example we are not given that power to resurrect ourselves so i think that would be a i'm a part of it also we would get that power so we can raise ourselves from the dead i can explain some of that because I used to teach that he rose himself from the dead, and I know why I used to teach it and what I saw before I saw mm. the verses that <laughs> the Father raised him. We don't have time to get into all that now. We've already been told, you know, we had three mm. minutes, and that was five minutes ago. <laughs> but in the afterglow, if we want to talk about that, I can explain yeah. some of where that comes from yeah um can i add one word please because of the faith and the trust the obedience that christ has with his father the relationship that keep, kept them together christ in the father the father in christ so there were nothing that could make christ doubt of his resurrection because the father had prepared everything for him the father spoke to his child, to his son, and told him, I am yours and you are mine. I am sending you to do a job and I am with you. So there is no doubt in that in Christ because he knew the father was behind it all. And whatever he was doing, he was doing to please his father. So that's how he knew that the father will rise him from the dead. So that, that's what I believe is the sequence of this situation. The trust he has in the Father, the faith and the obedience, all this put together, gave him that power to know that even if he put himself down, the Father will take over. Mm. Yes. We can talk about that as well. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> this is it. Yes. Thank you guys for the participation. It's truly been a blessing. Let us pray to close our father who art in heaven hallowed be your holy and precious name 
as we come before you once more, I want to give you thanks for this opportunity that you have given to us to come together to worship you, to study your words. And Lord, help us to apply these things to our lives. Help us, Lord God, to be able to share the truth with others. And help us, Lord, to leave all judgment to you. No matter what is going on around us, Lord, I pray that we will die to self so that we can be more like your son, Jesus Christ, in every way. Lord, be with us throughout the rest of this service and thank you again for all that you have done. As I pray through your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.